Okay, any questions about anything um, technically or logistically? Last class we were talking about um, edit distance. We've been, we've been talking about homology searching, homology meaning sequence comparisons. And last class we had worked through in, um, you know, I think oh, fairly gory detail um, what the dynamic programming algorithm is for edit distance. Are there any questions about that? Especially from my non-CS people. I'm delighted to have a question of the form. What is edit distance? What is dynamic programming? Any questions about how that worked? Okay. I strongly encourage everybody to be able to, again, if we go back to, to the, the, the edit, the, uh, you know, I don't want to review this too much. Make sure you can go through um, something like this figure out how the dynamic programming algorithm came up with a cost matrix like this, why that tells us the number of changes from one string to another, what the parents are and how you would trace back, okay, and um, basically how those algorithms work. Any questions about that? And we showed how we could find, um, you know, basically we, we saw two different, let's say, a, a couple of, of different applications of the um, basic edit distance algorithm. One to transform one string into another, the other to find the most, the, the, the best match for a pattern somewhere within a string. And those things you should understand. Any questions about them now that we remind remember where we were? Okay, so we've talked before, um, you know, Algorithmically, how do you compare sequences? Now, I'd like to talk, uh, bring this from general strings down to biological sequence comparison, because there are uh, several issues that come up in comparing biological sequences that it's important to get right. Um, that also, you know, again, analogous issues will come up in um, any kind of a sequence problem. So. Probably the most fundamental thing is, yes, I now know the way to compute by dynamic programming. The cheapest way to go from this string to that string, okay? Now, for the sequence to be the, um, you know, alignment to be meaningful, okay, you need to have an appropriate cost function. Okay. So when we talk about the edit distance of two strings, we talk about, um, you know, minimum number of changes, minimum number of insertions or deletions or substitutions. And when we talk about edit distance, we usually sort of assume that an insert costs one, a delete costs one, and an insert and a substitution costs one. Now, when you change the costs, you change what is the alignment that the two strings are going to have. Does everybody get that idea? I think we've talked about this a couple of times. I think we showed you for example, um, you know, if you make it too expensive to have substitutions, the alignment you find will be the longest common superstring, the longest common subsequence of the two strings, basically, right? If we make substitutions cheap, you're going to end up with a different alignment. And to find the alignment that you want that has the meaning for you in your application, you need to have the right cost matrix, okay? Again, we talked in here about text, about the idea that if, let's say, you were comparing text that is entered by a typist, okay, if I type a, an A, what's the key on a typewriter next to A? S, okay. If when I type this thing, I mean to type an A and I slam this down, that is a more understandable thing than if I typed an A, tried to type an A and I got something on the other end of the keyboard, right? So you might imagine that if, let's say, you're trying to correct a see, a, a see what typing mistake somebody made when they were um, entering text rapidly, it would be you might want to penalize a transition from an A to an S less than an A to a Z. Does that make sense? And coming up with the right matrix is the key to making your sequence alignment meaningful. Okay? And... Um, you know, in genomic sequences, which is what we're now going to talk about, um, there are, the weights are generally covered. There are sort of canonical matrices, which we're going to talk about, 
that define what the weights are. Okay? And uh, one of them we'll talk about our PAM matrices. But we'll talk about look now get look at the case of what should be the right cost function for biological sequences. Any questions about that? So the first claim I want to make is that there are several possible cost functions, matrices you might be interested in if you want to align biological sequences. First distinction is to note that there are at least two different kinds, well, two or maybe even three different kinds of biological sequence alignment problems we will have. One is where we have a DNA sequence and we want to convert it to another DNA sequence, right? This is over a base four alphabet. Another common thing is you have a protein, let's say your hemoglobin protein, that is defined as a amino acid sequence. That's written on a base 20 alphabet, right? And so, obviously, if you're trying to see how one protein evolves to another, you need a 20 by 20 cost matrix. If you want to see how DNA sequences evolve, you have a 4 by 4 cost matrix, basically. Does that make sense? That should make sense. So, an example of a commonly used um, DNA cost matrix, okay, if we want to define it in terms of distance, is this one, which is the blast similarity matrix, where we say that the cost of changing an A to an A is zero, and in fact, all along the diagonal, changing a symbol to itself is zero, right? The cost of transforming a C to a T is only one, Okay, so actually along this thing, everything is one. Transforming a C to a T is only one. Um, or a T to a C is one. Or a G to an A is one. Okay? Now, what, while the other costs of transforming one DNA base to another is five. Does everybody see that? So here is one where the cost matrix is not uniform, Right? in edit distance the way we've assumed. Transforming one character to another is uniform. So why is this maybe a better sequence comparison matrix than the other one, than other ones are? Well, it turns out because these chemical letters, A, C, G, and T, have various chemical properties, okay? That we say that a purine, okay, are the letters A and C, G, and a pyrimidine is a C or a T. If we think about a sequence evolving when there's a mutation, every mutation can either be called a what we call a transition or a transversion. A transition means we stay within the class, A to a, a G, okay, or C to a T, okay. A transversion crosses classes, okay. So an A to a an A to a C would be an example of a transversion, okay? Any questions about that? So which is more common? Transitions, it turns out, are things that happen more often. It is more often that an, that an A, if an A is going to mutate, it is more likely to mutate into a um, G than it is any other letter. Does that make sense? And if that's so, the cost of going from an A to a G should be less than going to any other letter. Does that make sense? If you're trying to capture the idea that these two sequences really are kind of the same, it is okay for them to, you know, you want to see that there be a relatively low cost way to transform this to that. If the mutations happen within a class, happen more often than the ones outside class, those things should be cheaper. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, actually, uh, is his face on that card? Okay, good. Take it. Okay, good. Okay, what? Without the hair. Without the hair. Yeah, it looks a little different, actually. Okay, good luck. Okay, <laughs> bye. Okay, good. Okay. So, um, okay. So, any questions about that? Okay. So, that probably makes sense. Now, you may see that I've got a sim another cost matrix over here. What's interesting or different about this matrix? Okay. Yeah. You're penalizing high for the same letter. Here, what you're saying is I'm penalizing high 
Okay? Actually, the reason is because what I really want to do is I want to reward you. Remember we talked at some point about the difference between distances and scores? If you want to compute the distance between two different things, then you want something where you get a low cost for something being the same and a high cost for being um, wildly different, right? If you want to compute a score where getting a higher score is better, you want to reward you for staying on the, you know, within, you know, basically the same thing, and then penalize you for a substitution. Okay? Yes? Well, I don't know where I lift. The question is, why don't I see the difference about the transitions and transversions? Well, I lifted this matrix from someplace. The guy who created this matrix didn't think there was that big a difference between transitions and transversions. If they did, and if they were interested in that, then that matrix should reflect the same structure. Yes? Okay, the, the first one is the flat similarity matrix, and the second one is the transition transversion. So that only computes scores based on similarity, whether this, uh, whereas the second one also takes into account the transition. Okay, so the claim here is that this matrix is, is the blast similarity matrix, so all they care is about the similarity. Whereas here's another matrix that's trying to capture this other phenomena. Okay, and that I can buy. Okay, any questions? Okay, so these are representatives of some kinds of matrices you might use on DNA. Any questions? Now, the matrix issue gets more interesting, actually, when you have uh, protein sequences. Okay, so what is, th there, there's several, let's say, how would we compute if we now have our 20 by 20 amino acid matrix? What would be the cost of, ma 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 how might we consider what the cost of transitioning one amino acid to another amino acid is, okay? And there's several logical ways people can think about this. One way to think about it is, if you think about the amino acid sequence as being generated by, you know, the, uh, a gene, then for any amino acid in the gene, there was sort of a codon, a DNA triple, right, that coded for that. So suppose, let's say, we had um, a gene that was coding for this amino acid, pro you know, this amino acid M, and we wa it ends up getting converted to a different residue, let's say a T, okay? According to the triplet code, there are a bunch of different, somewhere between one and six, triples, you remember, that code for this particular amino acid or any particular amino acid. Some of them code for as many as six. Some of them code for, uh, have as many as six codons coding for them. Some have as few as one, right? One way it cost matrix you might think about is how many DNA mutations does it take to convert this amino acid into that one? Does that make sense? And that would then be, perhaps, the distance between the minimum, the number of DNA changes you need, between the most similar triple for this and the most similar, tri sim similar triple for that. How many people understand what I'm saying? I feel I'm saying this a little clumsily, but the people get the basic idea. How many people are confused? Okay, good, okay, I am saying it clumsily. <laughs> okay, suppose, let's say we have a triple Okay, I'm going to say A, C, T, and another triple G, C, T, G, C, G. In order to go between this and this, I claim that there are two mutations you need to make, right? This needs to change, and this needs to change, right? Now, suppose we want to compare two proteins. They're both is coded for by genes, right? One way to think of how unlikely it might be that they evolved together, that one tr evol let's say they evolved from the same source, is how hard would it be to change from the coding sequence of this amino acid to the coding sequence of that one? And I claim that you could take a look at all the codons coding for the first amino acid and all the codons coding for the second one 
and find which two require, which pair, one from here and one from here, require the fewest changes, right? You'll know there will have to have been at least that many DNA mutations to go from this amino acid to this one. Is that, yeah? Why don't So one possibility, okay, you say you want to use the average. What's the average changes between here and there? Maybe that's an, a thing to do. Although, in principle, it is a, uh, um, let, let's say, that, let's say that, that might be a defensible cost function. Cost. So now you're going to say over all pairs of this and that, what's the smallest number of things? That might be a plausible matrix, okay? But one way is to capture the idea that the change between certain pairs of amino acids is complicated in an evolutionary way because it requires more base changes than the other one. Does that make sense? So that is a plausible idea for a matrix. And if you do it in the case of the, ma of, of the smallest number of changes, certain pairs require three changes. Many pairs require one. I don't know if you can see the pattern of ones and twos and stuff like that there. OK? Any questions? So that's one matrix. Yes? So the previous matrix, we found that the, cost, uh, the change A to Q OK, the other one was a DNA matrix, right? So one was a DNA matrix. We talked about a DNA matrix on a base 4 alphabet. Now I'm talking about a protein matrix on the 20 base amino acid alphabet, OK? So just like there would be an, ed an edit distance between English language characters, there's an, interest English la an edit distance between you know, um, French characters. OK, there's some other funny characters in French. I see. So another thing that you're saying now might be another way to make a matrix, right? You're saying that now, wait a second. If I am going from an A to a, from an ACT to a GCG, maybe I should instead of charging one for each of these things, I should charge according to the transition transver transversion frequencies, and maybe that's a better measure of cost between the two amino acids. That sounds like a plausible idea. Okay. So you have a, a good idea to make a matrix, and you have a good idea to make a matrix. OK? Here's another idea to make a matrix. Any questions? Here's another idea on how to make a matrix. OK? One thing that's true is that proteins are these chains of amino I mean, We like to think of them in here as letters. OK, because we're computer scientists and we are used to dealing with text. But the truth is that proteins are molecules. Is that right? And they are made of these molecular subunits called amino acids. Right? And it turns out that so each letter represents one of these subunits. That's the way to think of it. And it turns out that these different 20 different sub subunits have different chemical properties to them. OK? So one um, example of a difference is that some of them react differently in the presence of water. OK? So if you take a look at, um, we say that an amino, acid re an amino acid is hydrophilic if it loves water. Philic is love somehow, right? Does anybody, you know, is there a, um, uh, any other word people can think of with philic in it? Philanthropy, lover, that's right. Philosopher is lover of knowledge, I think, right? Okay, that's better than the one I was going to come up with, right? Okay. <laughs> hydrophobic. Other amino acids are hydrophobic. What does it mean to be some phobic? Okay, it means to be afraid of, right? So some of the amino acids don't like water. They are hydrophobic. And so what would you kind of expect to have happen if you have a chain of these things, some of which love water, some of which don't like water, and then you drop the chain in a bucket of water. What's going to happen? The things that don't like water are going to try to cower, OK? How can they cower? Well, they can try to bury themselves, their head, in, uh, you know, hide it by having other amino acids surround it, right? Does that kind of make sense? 
if you know if we dropped you guys into you know had you guys hold hands and threw you guys into the ocean the ones that you guys were most afraid of water would sort of cuddle next to the guy next to you right likewise if you liked water you would want to be on the outside of this thing so you'll fight to get on the outside the other one will fight to get on the inside okay and so the shape of the the protein molecule you get at the end is going to depend on some of these chemical properties does that make sense now let's think what that means from an evolutionary point of view if I have a protein here and I have a protein here this is supposed to be I want to see how similar these proteins are okay if this thing is on the outside okay the corresponding base of a very similar structure probably also is on the outside does that make sense if the structures are what's important to keep the same the structure is really what makes the protein do its thing right so if we're going to have two proteins that basically have the same structure then presumably at all the critical residues they probably have similar chemical properties does that make sense so here is a matrix that is um, built based on similarity of their chemical properties their hydrophobicity properties and so two things that are very very similar get tens okay so if you look at k to k gets a 10 okay along the main diagonal there are tens pairs of amino acids the R and the F that are very very different in their properties get much lower numbers right and so we would kind of guess that if the pro if this protein is going to evolve to another protein okay while preserving its function then presumably the changes that it made should be ones that cause very little chemical structure change in structure does that make sense and so we're more likely to move between two amino acids of the same basic properties than we are to go to one wildly different any questions about that do people see why this is a plausible cost matrix if we want to see the evolution of proteins okay any questions about that so now that we have another cost matrix we've now got at least three good cost matrices involved what is the right way to compare protein sequences okay and it turns out that the idea the problem is we have different criteria as to why it evolves maybe from a sequence the likelihood of one sequence transitioning to another or the likelihood of the protein transitioning to a, you know one amino acid residue transitioning to another what we really want is a cost matrix which is going to reflect what evolution does okay and the way that somehow what I would say is the most generally used matrices are constructed is kind of in a clever way um, by trying to look at seeing very much what evolution actually did okay a PAM matrix PAM stands here for point accepted mutation one idea here is to say well wait a second why don't we take lots of proteins align them and then see when well, once we have done the alignment see how often this changes to that right and if I count if I've looked at a hundred you know a, a, a ten thousand proteins and I've seen how often this changed to that in evolutionary practice by looking by doing an alignment and then counting how often these things changed that tells me how frequently they changed and from that I can figure out the things that change more frequently should have a lower edit cost and the things that change less frequently should have a higher edit cost does that make sense now there's one problem with what I just said okay let's see if we can catch you some slip of my reasoning here okay yeah okay so the problem is because I align and look at similar proteins the first question is if I decide to align proteins how do I align proteins without having the cost matrix in the beginning that's really right now a little bit of a problem here does everybody see that if I take two sequences align them 
and then count how often they are being changed, the alignment that I use should be a function of the cost matrix I start with, right? So it would seem that I am going to be adding a bias into this process based on what matrix I start with. Does that make sense? How many people see the problem? Oh, how many people don't see the problem? Okay, any questions about it? Or just say, I don't see the problem. I don't see the problem. Okay, so the problem is this. Suppose, let's say, I want to see, let's say I, want, I, I have a belief. Let's say I am going to try to figure out, let's say, um, how often, what the, let's say just converting binary strings to each other. I want to find that in computer software, um, as you go from one version to another version, okay, you know, binaries change, right? From Windows 7 change to Windows 8, right? And I want to figure out how often do zeros change to ones if I wanted to do an alignment between them, right? So one possibility is I take programs from one version and programs from another version, I align them, and then I count in the minimum cost alignment how many times zeros change to ones and ones change to zeros. The trouble is, what alignment I get here depends upon the cost matrix I used. Suppose to do these trial cost matrix things, I did the alignment where to transform a 0 to a 1, 0 cost 0, transform a 0 to a 1, cost 1, to transform a 1 to a 0, cost 500, okay? And a, zero, a 1 to a 1 was this. In the alignment I found using this matrix, I would never transform a 0 to a 1. Is that right? I do deletions, right? And insertions instead of doing that substitution. So if I computed statistics using this matrix, you would come to the conclusion that Microsoft never transitioned a 0 bit to a 1 bit. Does that make sense? Okay. So the question is, the idea that we're going to do alignments and find the statistics on them is good. The question now is, how do you do the alignments in a way that if you don't know the cost matrix at the beginning, it isn't going to harm you? Okay? And the way that they did this, as, as you noticed, was by aligning very, very similar proteins. Okay? So what if you only compared, instead of comparing a gene in, in yeast and in humans, which have had 180 million years to drift apart, or umpteen years to drift apart, okay? We instead compare very, very only pairs of proteins that are so similar that the cost matrix is essentially irrelevant. Does that make sense? If you have two sequences that only differ in, let's say, 1%, of the residues, then it is pretty obvious, you know, it's equal, 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 oops, equal, 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 right? So the idea behind the PAM matrix was that you compare pairs of matrix proteins which are so obviously similar that any trend, any change is going to be, you know, presumably a, 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 an easy to recognize change. Now you gather statistics on how often this happened, okay? And this now gives you a, so we don't know offhand, does nature more preserve, care more about the hydrophobicity, or does it care more about the um, number of bases that get changed, or does it care more about this transition, transversion? By looking at these statistics, okay, the claim is we can figure out how often one goes to another. Yes? On the, right, so what we're going to do is we're going to look at the 1% uh, of the residues where they differ. So the question is, if we only are going to see 1%, if that basically, when we compare pairs of very similar proteins, if only 1% of the bases differ, then in order to get meaningful statistics about how often these 220 by 20 or 400 pairs of transitions happen, you have to have a lot of pairs of similar proteins. Does everybody agree with that? So get a lot of pairs of similar proteins. Now we have a lot of things that are sequenced. The claim would be you've got enough pairs of things sequenced, enough obviously similar 
proteins, you can get good statistics on this. Yes? Um, can there be, if you have two proteins, say A and B, uh, can there be a difference in the cost transform uh, from A to B and vice versa? Okay, so what you're saying is, um, if, if I'm evolving, is it possible that um, it is more likely, you're, you're asking basically, should the cost matrix be symmetrical? Yeah. Okay? And the answer is, there, I, I see no reason why it has to be, right? This is a cost matrix by whatever nature is doing, right? It is not for me to tell nature that it should be symmetrical. Does that make sense? And in fact, I would guess there are chemical reasons why certain changes probably happen more often than others. Okay? So, um, and again, here, you know, so for example, there are certain um, evolutionary, uh, clear, there are certain thing, um, phenomena where because of something called methylation, okay, certain pairs of CGs, if you have a pair, dinucleotide pair CGs, it's likely to, tra to evolve into a what? Does anyone know what mutation is? I'm looking at my, by my molecular biologist here. I mean, methylation, that, 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 that there are these CG, we're talking a little bit about C CG islands. Oh. That CGs are under, what? The C can make, on the C. Right, so there are certain phenomena where Cs, it, when you have a CG pair in a sequence under certain conditions, it is more likely to evolve to a TG than anything else. And there's no reason to believe that a TG is equally likely to revolve, mutate back into a CG. So that's an argument that if you believe this, this, this process occurs, the cost matrix will not be symmetrical. Okay? Any questions? Okay? But these are the kind of issues that you have to do when you, when you think about any kind of an alignment problem. What is the cost matrix? And this is fundamentally an important thing. You know, occasionally people will come by, oh, what algorithm should I use? Okay? The most important thing is you get your cost matrix right, or else your alignments are meaningless. Okay? And so anyway, so that's the phenomena here. Any questions? So the PAM1 matrix is this thing that was computed statistically, okay, as what is the probability of a transition when the proteins differ in 1% of their residues, okay? Based on this, that says what is, that is seemingly the optimal matrix for comparing for aligning pairs of proteins that are very similar. What is the right cost matrix for aligning pairs of things that are very distant? The claim would be that if we, we don't no longer are interested in the case where we expect there to be 1% um, residues, what the claim is, is if you take this matrix, the PAM1 matrix, and you square it, okay, Basically, what was a probability, now the probability of something happening is going to correspond to about changing 2% of the residues, okay? And the claim is that by raising this matrix to a higher power, you end up getting costs that are more analogous to what happens when you have a longer period of time run, okay? Any questions about that? I'm not sure I'm being very convincing here. But what should be clear, yeah, questions? Then the claim would be that if you raise this thing enough and enough and enough, it will eventually um, become stationary. I think I believe that. Okay? Where essentially if you raise, if you think about it, these, wh wh what does raising it to the power do? It basically gives, in some sense, simulates instead of the one-step matrix, okay, what's the probability of this being turned into that? Right? When you multiply this matrix by itself, you say, what's the probability of this being turned into that after two steps, right? One of those steps might be staying where that, both of those steps might be transition me to myself and me to myself, and it's unchanged, right? Or one of those steps might be transition me to somebody else, and that's somebody else back to me, right? That's like yeah, it's a Markov process, right? And so the longer you, more you multiply this thing out, the probabilities that you have at the beginning that are sort of well-defined will diffuse and smooth out. 
and long enough in the future the probability that one becomes another I think will you know, we'll, we'll become stationary there's no question about that right but the claim is that if you want to align distant protein more distant proteins aligning using a matrix where the cost of going between two different residues is less is cheaper makes more sense and this is the way that you might construct such a matrix any questions about that okay so one way to think about it is if you know how much evolutionary distance there is likely to be between your two proteins okay maybe you're comparing a human and a chicken protein and you know that the common ancestor of the human and the chicken was um, I don't know I'm gonna say uh, 200 million years ago okay uh, you know, then you know that there's been that much evolutionary drift since then you'll have a certain amount of um, sequence variation you expect if a 1% change in protein corresponds to let's say a million years then what you would probably want to do is a PAM 200 matrix okay corresponding to a similar length of time since those two sequences diverged any questions okay any question about these basic issues of the matrices okay so the bottom line is that in order to find a uh, the right alignment you need the you know you need a right matrix these PAM matrices are good things that it, it makes sense to me how this was constructed okay and it makes sense that that probably does capture a lot about what uh, is going on with evolution um, more recently there are people use the same approach as the, the so-called PAM matrices the PAM matrices were very famous they were done relatively early in the genomic era more recently some people repeated this process using a lot newer data and they came up with things called the blossom matrices okay but bottom line these are constructed in the same way what is the similarity okay at a certain of a lot of closely aligned sequences what were the probabilities and use that to drive the matrix any questions okay any question on cost matrices okay okay so what I'd like to talk about now is get back to this notion of algorithms for sequence comparison and realize that that there are um, a couple of different problems there's one class of, of sequence comparison problem we haven't looked at yet okay when I did edit distance I showed you out it what's the cost of converting this sequence into that sequence does everybody remember that right that was string matching approximate string matching I also did here is a pattern here is a text where is it that this short pattern occurs likely in the text right that was substring matching the thing that I haven't done yet which I claim is also interesting is what if I have two long strings okay here's a long string and here is a long string and I want to know is there any short string in here that occurs well it, as a pattern in there okay I can compute the whole string to the whole string I can compute a one string to a part of the other string I claim it'd be useful to try to align two strings to figure out are there parts of this big string let's look at it here parts of this big string that occur in the other string okay any questions about that okay so let's say what when, what might be an application of when I would want to try to compare two long strings to see if there is something in there sh them in common which is interesting Can anybody what primers okay what okay mate pairs were something um, okay 
primers, okay, let's take prime. Mate pairs were, were a technology for sequencing. So that gave us a pair of reads that we knew were, far, were close together. Okay? And sometimes we use them in assembly, and then we throw it out because we're only going to worry about the final assembly we have. Okay? So that's not a good, that's not an example of what I want to be talking about. Primers are in general not quite what I'm looking for either. Although, if let's say I, let's, let's say that's not an example of what I'm looking for. I'm trying to make it an example. Yes. Uh, what? Document, Document plagiarism is a great example here. Okay. So now, suppose let's say that we have two people, and one person has, uh, you know, I have uh, your term paper and his term paper. Okay. Now. I don't want to know, I want to know if you guys plagiarize something. What is plagiarism? It means that you've got a large enough hunk of the two theses, two, two documents that are in common. Does that make sense? So suppose I now want to know, that's a good example here. I have paper one, I have paper two. Is there a large hunk of, the thesis, of, of this paper shared between the two of them? Right? If I want to ask myself, hey, is this hunk in your thesis that I knew how to solve by substring matching, right? But this is a different problem. Does everybody see that? And I claim this kind of problem comes up biologically in a lot of different, um, different cases, OK? One reason is because, um, you know, as we'll talk about when we talk about gene recognition, it turns out that for some reason, as, as um, in, in different organisms, okay, in certain organisms, the genes that code for proteins don't occur in a single piece, okay? We'll talk about this more later, so I just want you to believe me now, right? So let's say in one species, you might have a world where the gene for a particular protein is in one piece. In another species, the gene might be in two pieces, right? In this case, I don't want to know, is this gene in there? I want to know, is there a large hunk of a gene here which matches a large hunk of a gene there, OK? And that's what's biologically interesting. Any questions about that? OK? For the biologists, you know what I mean by these split genes. The rest of you will know it in a couple days. Um, for the computer scientists, I think the plagiarism example is compelling. We may have more experience with that. Um, <laughs> any questions? OK? <laughs> any questions about that? OK? Fair enough. So now let's think about how would we solve this plagiarism example, OK? Or this problem of trying to find is there a large hunk between the two genes, that, that the two sequences that are the same? Any ideas how we might do it? Let's think about this for a second. Because in one sense, the answer is going to be easy, given what we know. But it's easy with a clever, clever little bit of, uh, 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 a couple of clever little things. How would we do it, based on what we know? Yeah. So one idea that you're saying is, maybe I could build a suffix array or a suffix, you, you, take my first sequence, you're saying, concatenate it with the second, I think this is what you're saying, okay? Build the suffix array or the suffix tree on this thing. You're claiming that if these two sequences are, very, are similar, then they're going to have a large exact match in common. Therefore, I can find whether there is a, 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 what is the longest common string to these two. That's like what we talked about in class, right? So that'd be one way of solving this problem. But what's the limitation of that in the biological context or in, in what we're trying to do? Errors. Errors, Errors. Does everybody see? You're finding an exact match, right? If you wanted to try to find G, here I've got the yeast genome, here I've got the human genome. OK? What is similar? The answer is there is presumably no good exact sequence match. Me that's, that's meaningful, because so much evolutionary distance has passed, right? 
So if you wanted to do it, if you cared about exact similarity, like maybe you're saying in the plagiarism example, you say these guys are just going to cut and paste, okay? You would catch them under those conditions, but if they're occasionally changing capital letters to small letters, they're going to break you on that, right? Yes? Okay, you're, you're now saying, trying to give me some ideas about taking suffix trees and applying probabilities in them and stuff like that. I will say that that is hard and I don't know how to do that, okay? So that's my immediate sense. You know, I mean, maybe we could discuss it more afterwards, but that's not a way I'm interested in talking about it. Okay, yes? Well, what am I trying to find? Is it the longest common substring between these two? Not really, actually. If I say, what is the longest common substring between, um, let's think about it, but as long as longest common, wait, longest common exact substring is what he wanted, right? Did you want something different? Did you want longest common subsequence? Because it will be different. So you're saying, what if I find the longest common subsequence between the two strings, right? Well, how long will the longest common subsequence be? Let's think about this. Suppose your term paper was written just for convenience in binary, and so was his, right? Here's a string on 0, 1, let's say a random string of 0, 1s, okay? How big a common subsequence will they likely have? As long as the input Not as long as the input. But how long can you guarantee me if I have two binary strings of length n? What? Something like n by 2, probably, right? There's going to be about n over 2 zeros in this thing and n over 2 zeros in this thing, right? So just the subsequence, give me n over 2 zeros, is likely to be shared, right? And that's not the indicative of the plagiarism thing, right? Yes, there's something common. But we're missing the fact that we really want a chunk that is largely similar, that's close together. Does everybody see that's really what you want in the plagiarism example? Okay. You wouldn't want me to accuse you of plagiarism because both you and he used a lot of E's in your paper. That's right now what you're telling me, right? So any other ideas based on what we have done? Okay. What about using our tools from dynamic programming? Can someone come up with a meaningful way to do this kind of a comparison based on that? Okay. One way to think about it might be, I mean, the way I might think about it originally, is to say we did solve half this problem, right? We found a way of finding a pattern in a big text, right? And where did this pattern exist pretty well in that text? Is there any way to, how could we use that idea? to compare two big texts against each other. One possibility is you take chunks and start comparing, right? But how big a chunk should you take? Depends upon how blatant a plagiarizer you're trying to catch, right? Does that make sense? Okay, you don't know how big a chunk you're going to take. Does everybody see that? Okay. And we also have a problem that similarity okay, is uh, not what you want to look at. You don't want to say, hi, look, I found a region where this and this is identical of length 5. You want to say, look, here's a chunk of size 100 that differs from here to here by a distance of 7. That's much more interesting, right? Any questions about this? Do people sort of see what the subtleties here are? Okay, it's not quite so trivial yet. Okay, any questions? So what I claim is the following, okay? First of all, when we talk about similarity of regions, I claim here is one where the idea of similarity score is more meaningful than edit distance. Edit distance says two things are similar, right? I say you and I are, are 
have a distance of, of one if there is one change between me and you. The more meaningful question is percentage of similarity, right? Okay? If there's a big enough hunk that you and I differ by only 5%, that's interesting, right? So distance doesn't capture that idea. A similarity score does, right? If I give you points for a matching, right? The longer the matching is, the more points you get, right? If I give you five points for every character you match, the longer the match is, the higher the points you get, right? If I take off for a mismatch, and maybe take off for a, um, what you call it, a substitution, maybe that's another minus four, and then you have a bunch of other matches, this would be, the long match would be better than either this or this, right? If here we have a world where we've got two runs of identical things separated by a little bit of junk between them, right? But if the flanking regions are big enough, the score will be positive. Does everybody see that? So I want to argue that score here is important, okay? The other thing that I claim we want is the, define a matrix where Dij is going to be the highest scoring local alignment ending at the i and jth position. Okay? So he, question. Okay, so but you, there's, there's a couple different ways I, I could be thinking about. One thing is if I want to find the best possible alignment, I am going to think in terms of finding what is the best possible alignment ending at every possible pair of positions. You're saying, no, 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 think about the best possible alignments beginning at all possible pairs of positions. And if you really want to think that way, reverse the strings. And now whatever was at the beginning was now the end, right? Okay, so I'm thinking about the end, and that's how I'm going to think about it. Any questions? Okay, it doesn't really maybe make a difference, but, that, but, but I don't have to consider both possibilities. Okay, any questions? So the way to compute this thing, this is an algorithm called the Smith-Waterman algorithm, and this is a, maybe the most famous algorithm in bioinformatics. And what's interesting about it is that it really is just edit distance, except for three little changes. Okay? The first is that we, instead of being a goal of, max, of minimizing over three possible things, well, because we're minimizing distance, we're maximizing score, right? So bigger is better. The second is that because we are going to be looking for local chunks that align, the best possible, what is the Worst possible alignment, worst possible best alignment that ends at the ij spot, okay? I claim if I have two empty strings that end at the ij spot, what is the score, similarity score of, one em of the empty string and the empty string? Zero, right? Can you get anything... If, if zero is an acceptable answer to return, you can't get anything less than zero, right? Because I can find an alignment ending in zero at every single point in my matrix. Does that kind of make sense? I'm only going to be interested in alignments that do better than zero, okay? So we're going to allow ourselves the option of starting the alignment fresh at every cell. Okay, yes? You would say we maximize instead of minimize. It's just kind of like saying we look at the glass half full or half empty. I mean, what, what's the well, you know, again, minimization doesn't make... Why, 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 does it make a difference here for maximize, minimize? The answer is conceptually it does. Because here what we're trying to do is maximize scores as opposed to minimize edit distance. And scores capture the idea that we want. Because we want to get credit for long matches that are roughly approximate. Whereas if we're just measuring distance, short strings that have no changes are indistinguishable from big strings which have no changes. 
But if you just if if the numbers you use to maximize, if you just basically reverse them all, make the, the small numbers the bigger numbers, the bigger numbers the small numbers. There may be a way. What you're saying is, I I, I absolutely re I refuse to maximize. I am only a minimizer. Okay. <laughs> then maybe what you could do is to claim then that you take off points for a, ma a longer matching. Does everyone agree that what the symmetric version is, instead of maximizing and giving you points for a matching, you could think of it as minimizing and taking off points for every pair of characters you leave. That's the symmetrical view. Okay? And this sounds weird. So I agree, if you're determined to do it, that's how you would do it. But conceptually, what I claim we're going to want to do here is maximize, the min, we can always get at least a zero. It's like you get take the SATs, you get a 200, right? That's the minimum you can get, right? Okay? So you only, it's only interesting if you get, you know, if, if you're grading your SAT score, right? Suppose you, you start out with a score of 200, right? You get the question wrong, 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 wrong. You manage to get everything wrong, right? What's your score going to be? 200. Okay, because you're just going to say, well, I'll take what I had coming in. Okay? Same way thing as what Smith Waterman's going to do. And the final thing is, because we're interested in where are there locally, local matches that are interesting. Those local matches, matches can end, and we're looking at all possible places where you can end in this string and this string. We have to scan every cell of our matrix as a possible solution. So unlike edit distance, for substring matching it was the bottom row, for exact string matching it was the bottom corner, our optimal answer might sit anywhere. These are the three differences that matter. Any questions? So what is the Smith-Waterman algorithm? Um, bang. Here is a program for the Smith-Waterman algorithm. Boom, boom. Okay. What is this saying? It says that I am going to edit. What is the cost of editing my string S to T? Okay, we're finding the local alignment matrix, the best possible local alignment between any substring in S and any substring in T. I initialize each cell because just like when we initialized before rows and columns, those were really where our alignments could start, right? Now they can start anywhere. They can end anywhere and they can start anywhere. So now we're going to initialize every cell in our matrix instead of just ro a one row or one column. Now again, for every pair of positions, we're going to figure out what is the optimal way of ending on a match ending on an insert and ending on a delete. And we're now going to take which is the maximum score of these three possibilities plus the score of zero, right? The max of these four possibilities, that's really what this thing is doing. And that's what gets written into the cell IJ, okay? Any questions? And then ultimately what I'm going to want to do, if I want to find where is there the best example of the plagiarism between the two, the best local similarity, I'm going to have to look at every cell in my matrix, find where the maximum is, and that's going to be the one I return. Any questions about that? Yes? How is it different from edit distance? It just differs from edit distance in the three ways that I said. First I claim that there is the possibility of each cell being zero. That is what I said, right? I said that it's going to be maximization instead of minimization, right? If you look at this, I think you'll see that that direction is different, right? That's how I did the max instead of the min. And what was the other difference? The fact that the cell answer could be anywhere? That's going to be what's encoded in my goal cell function. So, for example, if I go back here, oh, let me shrink it, kabunk, kabunk. Here, I think, is my um, boom, boom. Here are my supporting routines. What are my supporting routines? 
Here is something that basically just scans. Again, I could blow it up, but you can see this. It's basically looking at, for every I and J, it's, it, this is a loop that's searching all pairs. For I goes to something, for J goes to something. This is just going through all pairs of, um, what you call it, cells, all cells in the matrix, all pairs of indices. Is the s cost of this cell better than the best one I know? If so, that's the most interesting stopping point, right? And the other supporting routine is I need to have mat at, you know, costs or, or, or scores that I get for matching. The difference is I here I accumulate five points positively for a match, and it costs me four points for a mismatch, right? Here it looks like for an indel, it costs me four. You can change those constants, but note that again, I get points for doing something right, and I lose points for doing something wrong. Any questions? Okay. Yes. You have, you keep the uh, index for where it ends. Well, so how do you know where it begins? So how do I know where it begins? Well, what I'm going to do here is the following. Let's look at an example now. Okay. Boom. Boom. Here is a um, matrix where I took two strings, and I asked to find where is the local similarity. I used those cost matrices. Where is the greatest similarity between these two strings? OK, boom. If you look at this thing, what do you see? You don't see a lot of, no of interesting things over here, right? Everything here is nothing very similar here. Nothing very similar here, right? But boom, suddenly there's an eruption here of num scores getting high. Why is that? Here I've got the word e public, OK? And here I've got the e space public. Does everybody see that? Now, where is the highest cost alignment in this matrix? 31 there, right? Now, this is an edit distance matrix, basically, right? There were four different possible things that could have been my predecessor here, right? What were they? It could have been a insert, a delete, a match or substitute, or a zero, I hit the end of the line, right? Which was a parent of minus one, right? Now, if I want to find out what was the alignment from this, I'm going to ask, follow my parent chain and say, what was my parent? Turned out it was this one. What was my parent? It turned out it was this one, this one, this one, this one. Turned out that I had to have deleted. How did I get here? Um, I believe that what I did was... Um, How did I, oh, I think I went up like this, right? I think I, what I did is I, um, one, two. I believe that what I did was this. This is what I did. OK? Again, without the parent matrix, you have to reconstruct this a little bit. But this is what I think the optimal alignment was, right? And this came from here, OK? What happened in this alignment? E matched to E to give me five points, right? Um, actually, no, this is not what I did. This, that's not it. It went this way, I think. This is what I'm pretty sure it went, right? E, to, to, get from, to get rid of this blank, it cost me four points, right? To delete that. Once I had that, now I can get five more points from matching it, right? And then from here, I keep getting five more points of matching, right? And eventually, I got back to the cell that was 0, 0 that had no parent, right? And so what I could do is once I found the right cell, knowing that I have this parent relation, I can walk back to find what was the actual matching involved. Is that convincing? Any questions about this? So what's neat is this is a way to see is there any feature in common. This shows what is the most similarity. Maybe I'm going to be interested in are there any long pieces of similarity, right? I might want to know when you plagiarize his paper, what are the pieces in there, the maximal pieces that are more than um, 20, you know, 
get scores of more than 30. Okay? I can cruise through this matrix for all cells that are more than 30. Start from the biggest, walk backwards, okay? And find all the interesting evidence to confront you with. Any questions about that? Okay? So the Smith-Waterman algorithm is a very good thing, okay? Because it enables us to, um, what you call it? It enables us to find local similarities between long texts. Any questions? Okay. Any questions about how this one works? This is a good one to work. You have a homework problem about this, so this is a good one to, to know why you have to make it work. Yes? If, if you had just reversed the signs on the way you calculated that, you would do a minimization, right? You're determined to do a minimization. Uh, well, if you <laughs> want to do a minimization, let's say you want to do a minimization. How would I make this a minimization problem? Let's go back to my Smith-Waterman and make it a minimization. Okay, it's always costly to debug on these things. Now what I'm going to claim is, the main thing I'm going to do is, first of all, turn this into a minimization, right? Right. Then what I'm going to do is go to the next procedure. When I look at what these cost things are, right, the matching, right, those are just I am probably going to negate gone. every single one of my right. cost values. Right. Okay? You could just change all those pluses to minuses. Wait. What I claim I'm going to do is... Oh, you, you claim I, I could just change instead of where I had a plus, leave that the same and make these minuses. Yeah. And I think I believe that. Okay? So if, let's say the maximization in your computer is broken. <laughs> okay? You can do this. You can do Smith-Waterman by changing that, 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 and that. So the previous statement really was just you, you want to do um, cost instead of... Um, the primary uh, thing uh, is that you want to do score, yeah, score okay? Yeah, and yeah, scores yeah. are naturally defined as bigger being better, okay? If that bothers you, you can define scores where more negative is better, and that's really all that you're saying, okay? That's not... Yes? Like in biology, we usually look for how similar the sequences are rather than how different they are. Right, no, but he's saying is, well, suppose you lived in a world where you, were, you could be trained to say that more ne that more negative meant more similar. I, I was just okay. going, going back to that one statement that you had. It, it's math okay. instead of it's, I, I, I claim that, okay, so again, there's different ways you can write it. It's clear that it's not just a question it's of... It's a question of minimization or maximization. It's a question of, like you said, scores and... Okay, the main thing is it's a question of, right, that the, when I say maximize instead of minimize, the reason is because we're thinking in score world. Okay, and score world is naturally positive. Okay, you could view it, you know, it's unnaturally negative, it's naturally positive, you could do it either way. Okay, any questions about that? Any other questions about the Smith Waterman algorithm? Why it is a useful thing to do? Okay, so it's interesting because now with, and what's the time that it takes? Let's think about that. Okay, what is the running time of the Smith Waterman algorithm? It was n times m before to figure out whether or not there was one pattern anywhere in that string, right? The full pattern matched. What's the running time of this algorithm? Exactly the same. This is order n times m, right? Okay, let's go back here because again, we have n times m cells we're filling. Each cell we're filling, we're doing a constant amount of work from, right? We're doing one more thing at each cell, saying, oh, you can also be zero, okay? So this is still quadratic, okay, but gives us in principle a lot more information than the other one did, right? Any questions about that? Yes? Um, if you have to, uh, if you had prior knowledge about the document being matched, so you knew that the documents would be uh, majorly similar except for certain parts, and you basically had to find the differences, uh, would you be able to... Um, like, instead of maximizing, uh, use the, the cost measure to uh, detect the differences? Okay. Um, so, again, I'm trying to figure out what your application is. Um, something like code versioning. Like what? Code versioning. Code versioning. So, you want to say, you want to do diff, is basically what it is. Gee, how do you do diff in a... Uh, well, see, with diff, right now, the way Unix diff would work, you're trying to figure out what's the changes in converting the whole thing to the whole thing. Is that right? 
Now what I'm saying here is not diff, but similarity thing, right? Suppose someone took one of the files and scrambled it up, right? Diff won't necessarily come up with that as far as I know. Am I right? Okay. So if you add, if, if I took a, P, a program here, I'm not... So if we were doing string matching, right? Where was a string matching? It would uh, get confused. Suppose that I give you the string, a long pattern A and a long pattern B, right? And I did a complete alignment against the string B followed by A, right? The edit distance between these two whole strings is going to only capture half the similarity, right? It's sort of either got to decide to basically compare those things or to compare those things, right? The local similarity will give, show you all regions where there is similarity that lights up. I, I don't think, that's not answering your question, I don't think. Say this again. Okay, so what the claim is, what I would like to say is once you know between two versions what parts of them are the same, you delete what's left them and what's left is what's different, okay? And that may be what you want to do. Smith-Waterman will show you where are their chunks that are the same, right? What's not the same is different, okay? And that's really, I think, what you're really interested in. Any questions? Okay, good algorithm. Let me talk about one other biologically important and otherwise important extension to the Smith Waterman algorithm. Yes, question. Is there any faster way to do it? Um, is there a faster way to do it? Okay. So you're saying you're spending n times m time to find the local comparisons. Um, you would like a faster way. We're going to talk about the claim is in the worst case, no. Okay. In the heuristic sense, yes. So if you're willing to find local similarities but not guarantee you the best possible similarities, that is a useful thing to do, okay? And we'll talk about that. That's how something like BLAST works. So BLAST does not use, is, which we'll talk about a little bit more. You'll play with that in your homework also. BLAST is the most popular sequence alignment tool. It does not do an exact Smith Waterman between your sequence and every other sequence in the database because it's too expensive. But what I can guarantee you people do is once they have narrowed down the list of sequences that they care about, then what they will do is use the Smith Waterman algorithm to find the real right alignments. Okay? So the answer is there are faster, rougher ways of doing it. But there is not any better way in principle, a significantly better way in an interesting sense to do the dynamic program than what we're talking about now. Okay? Yes? My concern is, is there, to de is there any way to decrease the memory uh, user that the algorithm could have used? You're saying you want to decrease the memory from quadratic. And the answer is yes, and we'll talk about that next class. Okay? Very clever way to decrease the amount of memory you need. Okay? Any questions about that? But that will save that excitement for next class. <laughs> Any questions? <laughs> okay. What I'd like to talk to you about, though, is another sequence issue in sequence alignment, which we can solve, which is important to solve, is the question of what, uh, what we call gap penalties. Okay? So when we want to try to figure out, let's say, the cost of editing um, let's say you're doing a, um, let's think back to your plagiarism example again, okay? So you have the original author of the text, right? And you have his buddy, the plagiarizer, okay? And what the plagiarizer did, most likely, says, oh, I can't make it exactly the same, right? I'm going to insert one relatively uninspired sentence in the middle of this piece of text that I'm plagiarizing, right? 
Now, if you think about it, if you want to figure out the cost of changing this document to another for the purposes of detecting the plagiarism, right now we, we pay a cost per character for a deletion. Does everybody see that? Is that the right model to try to detect whether or not there is plagiarism? Okay? And I claim not really, right? Because if I'm trying to detect whether you plagiarized something, if I have the thing is the same, and then you stuck in a, th a, a long paragraph or a short paragraph, right? It's one thing you did. Does everybody agree with that? There's been one mutation event in going from my original to your plagiarized copy, right? Namely, somebody, in, you inserted a piece of text you Googled from someplace else probably, right? <laughs> okay? So it is, I'm going to get the wrong answer somehow about the score if I charge on a per char character basis for something that is really trying to reflect a per event thing. Does that kind of make sense? Yeah. So if we come in a world where gaps in sequences, okay, uh, the size of the gap is relatively unimportant then counting the cost of characters, the, delete, the cost of deleting characters as linear in the, in the number of characters to be deleted overstates the cost of it. Does that kind of make sense? Yes. Okay. So my claim is the following. My claim is that in sequences, okay, there are many reasons in genomic and other sequences why here you've got a gene there is an evolutionary event that happens that inserts a bunch of other stuff in between there. Maybe not a gene in a biological sequence. There are these things called transposons that hop in there and uh, stuff that gets stuck in there. Remember we talked about the, um, what you call it, these repeat sequences where somehow the, the, the sequence sort of stutters. AT, 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 right? Um, we have this idea of that, that there's these events where, that, where genes split, there's things that get inserted in them, these introns, and they sometimes go away, okay? So we need a way to compare sequences where we can charge less for a long run of gaps than the um, basis, you know, then, then basically just deleting them one by one. Does everybody agree with that? My other example here of an application where it matters sometimes is have you ever seen a movie poster for a bad movie where they will give you the quote from the movie, right? You know, it'll say, you know, great, dot, 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 okay? You know, good, good example of a film, right? Dot, 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 okay? And these dot, dot, dots are ellipses, things where the guy deleted part of the review, right? So you can imagine or remove it. This is a great example. You know, this is a great waste of time, right? <laughs> this is a good example of a film that never got made, should have been made, right? <laughs> your, if your job is to try to select these quotes, to be convincing, you want the smallest number of deletions, gaps, right? Doesn't matter how much you delete, right? But if you see a movie quote where you see word dot dot dot, word dot dot dot, word dot dot dot, you know they've done some serious editing. Is that right? <laughs> Any questions about that? The principle is clear. So how can we do sequence alignment in a way where we um, charge less for a gap than just one character per deletion, right? We give you some kind of a volume discount. That's what we're trying to do. Exactly right, right? Yeah. Okay. So, in principle, we're going to talk about a couple of different kinds of gap penalties in here. Next class, because we're running out of time, we'll talk about things called affine gap penalties, okay? Where you pay a cost that is one cost for starting the gap. No, 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 not so fast. No, 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 no. <laughs> Start one cost for starting the gap and another linear cost for the size of the gap, okay? If A is big, it will dominate the cost of the individual character deletions. For If A is big relative to B, 
for moderate sequences. In fact, biologically, what people often like is they say the cost of a gap should grow logarithmically in the size of the gap. Okay, that seems to be something that's supported by some models. So how can we compute the edit distance in this case? Okay, I will propose the following recurrence relation, a way to generalize edit distance, okay, where we pay a different cost for a chunk of gaps, okay? Namely, we're now going to let Vij be the optimal way of editing the first i characters of this into the first j characters of that. But along the way, we're going to compute a few other recurrences. Let's let Gij